started Make Life Fun podcast because I needed more fun in my life. When I became a mother, I, for some reason, just put on this like high ponytail, mom jeans, and nose to the ground. I wasn't having fun. It wasn't until I started having fun that it started becoming easy. Fun and mental health go hand in hand for me. I've been in this mental health game my whole life. And mental health as a mom, oh my gosh, huge. I think that healing myself and motherhood has has to go hand in hand because he is happier and better for it because I've done the work on myself. And it needs to start with you believing in yourself that no matter what is going on around you, that you as a person right now, you are worthy. You are purposeful. You are needed. I feel like I'm finally home. <laughs> I feel like I'm finally in this place where I am happy to be me. I'm happy in my skin and I am so lit up to like help other people. I'm so lit up for other people to experience this because it's what my wish and my mission is for every woman is to find safety within themselves because it took me a long time to get here. I started Make Life Fun podcast because I needed more fun in my life. I needed more fun when I became a mother. When I became a mother, I, for some reason, just put on this like high ponytail, mom jeans and nose to the ground. And I had blinders on and I wasn't having fun. And once my mentor, my coach was like, Josie, when was the last time you went outside? I started thinking of all the things I wasn't doing anymore just because I became a mom. And it wasn't until I started having fun that it started becoming easy so Make Life Fun podcast was birthed from that. Fun and mental health go hand in hand for me because I believe that when you're having fun, you're almost like in a whole new universe, so to speak, because you're not thinking about anything. You're just in the moment that you're in. You're just in the zone. You're having fun. You're laughing. You're smiling. And you don't have time to think about oh, my makeup isn't right. You don't have time to think, oh, my jeans, my tummy, like you're just playing. You're just having the best time of your life. And for me, play looks like going outside, putting my feet on the ground and going for a walk. That is play for me. And getting on the ground with my son, that is play for me. And that's another way to just be in the present moment. So mental health and play, I think go hand in hand. They have to. Mental health throughout my life and becoming a mom. I feel like I've been in this mental health game my whole life. <laughs> Honestly, I started on this mental health journey in this when I was in seventh grade. So that was a while ago. I started seeing counselors because of my childhood. I started seeing counselors for what seemed like a long, long time. And it was never fun. And it was always like a chore. It, mental health back then to me was like where you went to like stir the pot almost. And it was almost traumatizing at the beginning of this mental health journey because it was like reliving the experience over and over again. It wasn't until I started being above the experience, looking at it from a point of view as the point of view, I guess I was looking at it was that it happened. I survived it. I'm better for it. A point of forgiveness, a forgiveness for my parents, a forgiveness for my family, a forgiveness for myself, that I was able to not be so triggered as I was healing through that journey. And mental health as a mom, oh my gosh, huge, huge. My son senses everything. Like he senses every vibration, every emotion. So I think that healing myself and motherhood has, has to go hand in hand because he is happier and better for it because I've done the work on myself. And I think being able to let him be who he is as he grows and not having the fear of his mistakes, not being triggered by the way he acts, I think for both of us, it's just going to make life more fun and easier but because I did the work. I mean, I'm not saying that it was always easy. It's been a journey. I've been on it for, like I said, a very long time, but being able to look at it from a non-judgment point of view, being able to look at it in a point of it happened. It wasn't great. I didn't deserve it, but I turned it into, into a healing for myself. I turned it into a way now that I'm helping other people 
So it's just, yeah, I was born in Haiti, so I'm Haitian. I moved to the United States when I was six years old from Haiti, not knowing a word of English. I also started first grade without knowing a word of English. Like if you can imagine that, like even me knowing that I did it, thinking about it, I'm just like, how, how did you do that? (laughs) Yeah. So moving to the state was a big one for my family. It's a story of manifesting dreams come true because my dad, since he was very young and my mom, they both said that they were going to bring their children to America for a better life. And their family and friends would laugh at them saying like, get real, be realistic. But they just kept the faith of they're going to make it happen. And they believed in it so much that they were able to bring us here. And that is such a blessing and such a gift to be able to have the life that we have. Moving from a whole different country in Haiti to America, that was a big shift, a big change. So my parents, yes, they came here for freedom, but freedom was work. Freedom was hard. So not knowing a word of English, my parents were working two to three jobs at one point. I was the oldest, so that was my responsibility to stay home and take care of the kids for my parents to be able to work and provide for us. And I know that is one of the reasons why our childhood was so rocky is because my parents just went nose to the ground and they were just working so hard to provide for us that at some point you break, right? And so I didn't have the easiest childhood. Childhood was, yeah, talking about how to bring this up. I do not want to speak this as a victim. I want to speak this as a survivor. I want to speak this as a victor because I'm proud of the person I am today. And I have forgiven my father and my mother because they did the best they could. But I did get taken out of my parents' home at a young age due to abuse. It was what was quote unquote normal in my family because I mean coming from another country that's the that was the norm so for me growing up I thought it was normal to get screamed at or to get spanked hard I thought that was normal but it turned out that it wasn't normal it's not normal and it should have never happened but it did and it has been a journey since then to find my voice find who I really am. And that's probably why too, I waited so long to have a child. I waited until I was 33 years old to have my first kid because I was just thinking, I don't want to do that to my child. I don't want to harm my child in that way. And so I almost had to like deprogram myself and foster in some new beliefs in order to allow myself to even be a mother. So my childhood wasn't, wasn't easy. But I've since then forgiven my father. Like when I got married three years ago, I had him walk me down the aisle, which was huge for me. I talk to him now and I'm able to have a beautiful relationship with my mom and my dad. And they're actually the best grandparents (laughs) now that we've all gone through it and yeah, made it to the other side. Coming to the States and starting first grade without any English, with not knowing a soul, (laughs) except the people that had sponsored us. We did get sponsored through the Lutheran church. And so we did have sponsors that kind of helped us get on our feet. But as far as not knowing a word of English, I kind of blacked that part of my life out. Like it was trauma, plain and simple. It wasn't It wasn't all rainbows and butterfly. It was hard. I remember just being taken out of class all the time. I remember not being able to go to recess. I was always in some sort of learning program of learning how to speak English. And it was hard, especially because the person who was teaching me English didn't speak Creole. She spoke French. And so it wasn't even the same language. It was just, yeah, I give props and kudos for that younger six, seven-year-old me. She is a rock star because I honestly don't know how she did it. As far as making friends, we were the only black people in our school. We we're the only black people in our church. We we're the only black people. And so that was a trauma too, because I didn't fit in. I didn't look like everybody else. I looked different from everyone. And so 
being a kid, you want to feel included. You want to belong. And I don't think just being a kid, you want to belong. I think just as a human in general, you want to belong. You want to feel like you are a part of something. And that wasn't my reality. Yeah, we settled in Nampa, Idaho. (laughs) Out of all the places in the world we could have gone, God sent us to Nampa, Idaho through the Lutheran Church. And I have to believe there was purpose for it. Like I said, I was, our family was the only African-American family that was in Nampa at the time. And yeah, it was, wow, quite an experience. There's so much positive that came from all that hardship that was endured. I have, oh my gosh, my life. I am so much like a go-getter. I am a balls to the wall kind of person. I don't give up easy. I will be the first one to try something new. Fake it till you make it was like my mantra (laughs) that got me to where I am today. I just would put on that positive face and put on that belief that better days are ahead and not behind me. And I get that from my mother. She is a super spiritual woman. She is God fearing. And she always spoke life into us that there's a reason for our being. And I really held on to that. And I believe that too. And another mantra I had growing up was this too shall pass. Like it won't be here forever. Like it's going to get better because it has to get better. Yeah. So it made me tenacious. It made me hungry for life. And now that I have my own family, it makes my family life just, I want the best for my family. I want the best for myself. And I don't know if I would have the thoughts and the emotions and the excitement and the hunger that I have for life that I have now, if all that didn't happen. I graduated a year early from high school. I was ready to be an adult because I thought that's where it's at. You become an adult and life is grand. You get to make your own decision and you're free. (laughs) Yeah, no. So I graduated a year early and within a week of graduating a year early, I was in my own apartment. I was working as a telemarketer. I can't even believe that. (laughs) And I just started grinding. I feel like I've been doing that ever since. (laughs) Being an adult meant so much. Like the list goes on forever. If I would have known that, I wouldn't have graduated a year early. I wouldn't have moved out two weeks after. Like, yeah, I wouldn't have graduated that early. I would have stayed a kid for as long as I possibly could. Yeah, so as a child, I loved to play. I loved to laugh. I loved to smile. I think since I was a young, young person. That was my motto because I just remember going hard on all the things. So I was into sports. I did almost every single sport you could think of. I even did jump roping. Like I was was a track star. I was one of the fastest track runners. I was the point guard in basketball. So I was all about play even then. And that was kind of how I was able to escape my reality was through playing, was through having fun and also reading. I would, I've been a bookworm my whole life. I have always been into learning and to putting myself into different realities. That's what books did for me. I was able to put myself into a different, different narrative. And yeah, so being a child, I remember a lot of good. There was a lot of great times as a kid. What I did with the bad was bury it very deep and put like a stale wall between me and the bad and just focused on the positive, which I know for a lot of people are like, how? How were you able to focus on that positive? And it has to be because my mother instilled in us to have faith. She always instilled in us that the battle, she always said, the battle is not yours give it away. Like the battle is not yours. Like what you can do is control what you can control today. Like the battle isn't yours, give it to God. And so even as a young person, I was able to do that. And also too, once we tell people what we're experiencing, we tell people what we're going through, they immediately want to fix it (laughs) and they can't fix it. Most of the time, what I found whenever I spoke up to tell what was going on in my life, the person would call my father, my home, where the problem was to tell them like this needs to stop. So then I would go home and it would be even worse. And so that made me not speak up. 
like it had to get really bad before anything got done. Like I had to literally be hospitalized before it was known before I was able to like get the help that I needed. Being a child, we just feel that shame. We feel that guilt and we want to, yeah, we want to be heard, but it's so hard to be heard because nobody's listening. And even when they're listening, they don't listen to like hold us and hold a safe space for us. They listen to try to fix, fix, fix. And sometimes there's no fix damage upon damage, trauma upon trauma. And honestly, my saving grace was just the fake it till you make it. And that got me to a point where then I was able to get the healing and the work that I needed. But honestly, it was just being disassociated from it, being completely disconnected from it and looking at it from a point of this is the moment that I'm in, like, be present here now, even though I didn't know the words for it then, but it was like focusing on the moments that I could control, focusing on where I was at any given time. I don't even know how I knew to do that, how I knew to disassociate with my body and completely leave my body when trauma was happening to me. I'm so proud of her for doing that. I'm so proud of me, little me for saying, you know what? It's not safe here. We're going to like leave this body for a moment and then we'll come back. And then, yeah, I was able to somehow, some way, like put that in a different box, like put it away, put on that happy face, which I know wasn't probably healthy, but it helped me. The moment that it switched from adult, from childhood to adulthood was super young. Like for some reason, the number 10 my be by 10 years old, I was already a full-fledged adult. <laughs> like by 10 years old, I was taking care of my siblings. I was changing diapers for my youngest brother. I was cooking. I was cleaning. I was, I was an adult. I was, I didn't feel like a kid. It breaks my heart to think of kids that would possibly be going through the same thing that I went through. But I would like to say to any buddy, not even a kid, like an adult, a person who is in that place where they feel trapped and they feel like they have no control over their lives. I would encourage them to like place their hand on their heart. I would encourage them to like, honestly, just feel their heart beating. They are worthy of having a good life. They are worthy. You are worthy of having a smile on your face. You are worthy. And I think that is where it needs to start. It needs to start with you believing in yourself that no matter what is going on around you, that you as a person right now, you are worthy. You are purposeful. You are needed. It took me leaving the States, honestly, to find that about myself. I went on a five month, I call it sabbatical. My husband calls it me running away from life. (laughs) I took five months off of life to go to Southeast Asia and I was on my own and I was able to feel something that I'd never felt before. And that was like, I can control my day. I could control how I feel. I could manifest what I want in my life. Like it was just such a beautiful unfolding of like being away from the day to day and just showing up and just me. Like I didn't know anybody. I didn't have to be anybody. I could just be Josie. I could just be myself. And that was just eye-opening to me. And that was the moment I went on this journey that, oh my gosh, I am enough here. Like I am safe here. I am secure here. I am worthy of it all. Like I was created for something more. And that was through, I did yoga while I was away. I was in nature every day. I went and saw a medicine man. I went to this temple where you, it's called the healing springs and the water actually comes from like the top of the mountains. And there's like a healing spring where you can just wash away. I cried and cried and cried and released and released. And that experience for me was just like nothing like talk therapy is great. It has a place for it. But honestly, just that release of just letting it just like that water wash it all away from my body was just so, so healing, so cathartic. I don't think there was any point in my childhood where I said enough was enough. I was gonna bear it. I was gonna 
I mean, who knows? Maybe I wouldn't have even made it because I was, that was my reality. And so I believe that that was what it was. I didn't think there was another way to be. There was never a point where I said enough was enough. Like I said, I literally had to go to the hospital and my sponsor, our sponsor, our family sponsor at the time came in and said, it's time for you to be brave now. It's time for you to speak the truth now. It's time. And I, I promise this time when you speak the truth, you will be supported. I was so scared. I was so scared. Because before then I was saying I fell or I was saying that I wasn't telling the truth. And I would love to say that by me telling the truth, it all was hunky-dory and wonderful. I mean, it definitely got harder before it got better, but I was put in foster care and that was a journey in itself. I was in foster care from seventh grade until I graduated a year early from high school. I felt like I abandoned my siblings. Honestly, that was a weight that I carried on my shoulder until just a couple of years ago. That was, I felt like I abandoned them. I left them behind. I was told that they would be watched over. They would be supported. Like that would never happen to them again. I was reassured that all this was going to be a certain way and it wasn't. And so I felt very responsible. I felt like I was the oldest and I should have, shouldn't have left. But I also now know that me leaving did alleviate some of it, did help in some way. And it was necessary. It needed to happen. It needed to happen. I felt like I was trying to make up for lost time. For the longest time, I was playing catch up is what it felt like. And I don't know, I guess just showing up. And just being that voice that they could reach out to and just letting them know that I love them and letting them know that I was there for them. Yeah, just showing up and continuing to show up. So for the longest time, it was just act like it never happened. So for the longest time, it was just bury it as deep as you possibly could and just go on living your life. And when I went on my journey to find myself, my journey of healing, I came back with all these questions, started stirring the pot, which was not welcomed. Nobody wanted to talk about it. Nobody wanted to relive it. And what I had to learn is I stirred the pot for probably a few years. I was stirring the pot because I wanted answers. I wanted to know why. And what I found on that journey is there is no answer. There is no why. People do the best they can with what they know at any given point. And when they know better, you can choose to do better. So that's where it really shifted for me was my parents moved from a different country to America, not knowing a word of English. They were able to work their butt off and provide for us beautiful. Like we were provided for, we had a roof over our head. We had food to eat. We had clothes. Like we had everything we needed and they did the best they could. And it was at that point that I figured that out, that my parents did the best they could with what they knew. Like, honestly, they thought they were doing us a service. Like my dad did not spank me and hurt me because he thought she deserves to be spanked and hurt. In our culture, it was you did something wrong, you get spanked, you learn from it, you move on. Like it wasn't like in his mind, it wasn't the way I see it. Right. And so, and my mom being like, I'm going to stay because this is the only person I know in America. Like this is my partner. I moved to a new country with him with four kids. Now I have another kid here in the States. I have five kids. So it was just, I mean, they did the best they could. And that's why I was able to be able to forgive them and be able to have a relationship with them. And like I said, watching them with my son and with their other grandbabies, it's like, really? (laughs) They love them to pieces and they're so heartwarming and they're so loving. And I believe that honestly, they, if they could take it back, they would. My view of my parents changed since I became a parent. Wow. I haven't thought about that. Well, my relationship with my mother has been stronger than it's ever been since becoming a mom, because I feel like if anybody can relate to what I'm going through, it's her. Since the moment I found I was pregnant, she was the first person, well, besides my husband, she was the first person that I told that I was pregnant. And she just kept 
sow it into me what a blessing it is, sow it into me what a delight it is and how I should just enjoy this moment and how I should just speak life to my baby in the womb. And she encouraged me to, to like take care of myself during that journey. And wow, I actually left my husband for three months when I was um, pregnant to come home because we weren't seeing eye to eye and she just babied me. Like she took such good care of me. I didn't even know. I didn't even know I could be taken care of in that way, but she was cooking for me every day. She was giving me different things I could do to like alleviate the nausea. And she, she just took, I felt like a child again. That was, oh my gosh, just even thinking about it now, it just brings me tingles all over my body. Yeah. I mean, my mom's relationship has never been better. My parents' relationship with my husband have grown over the years, honestly. They've always liked him. They've always cheered us on. And they've always pushed for us to get married since early on. We did wait eight years before we got married. So for them, that wasn't normal. (laughs) That definitely wasn't what they wanted for their daughter. They wanted me married within that first year, first two years. And then when my husband became a geologist and we moved to Austin, Texas, and he was working in West Texas, they were like, you're not leaving without being married. You're getting married and then you're going. And I was like, no, I'm going. And they just weren't about that life because they wanted, yeah, they wanted us married, but they've, they've always treated him like their own. And the bond has only gotten stronger since we've been married. And especially since we had a child. So how I met my husband is he, I was not ready to meet my husband. Let's just start there. I was definitely having the time of my life. I was what, 21, almost 22. So I was just having a ball. I was just having all the fun in the world. And of course, there he is. He was a bouncer at a bar here in Boise called the Bistro. And he asked for my number and I usually don't give, I never gave my number out. Back then I had this standard number I would give that was like (laughs) one of those (laughs) answering machines that says, sorry, (laughs) today. But I gave him my real number and he didn't call actually. And so I had gone back out with friends and there was two bouncers then. And I went to the other bouncer and he's like, you have to come here because I'm the head bouncer. And I was like, I'm not talking to you. I gave you my number. You didn't call. And yeah, no. And that very next day, of course, he calls and the rest was history. Like, And looking back, thank God he didn't call right away. Thank God he waited because I wasn't in the headspace for him yet. (laughs) And so it was perfect that he waited those two or three weeks before we were able to connect. How our relationship has been, we like waited eight years to get married and we've been married three years now. And so, yeah, together 11 years and we definitely have changed. (laughs) Definitely have changed and grown together. We started out as both being party animals, partying way too hard to then moving away from our family together. And I think that's where most of our growth happened was he was working like four hours away from where I was living in Austin, Texas. And we were forced to communicate. We were forced to talk. (laughs) We, I mean, when you're with your partner every day, sometimes you could go without even talking, just being in the same space, right? And so being in this long distance relationship for four years of our relationship, I think really honestly is what made it so we were able to last because we had to communicate. We had to say how we were feeling. We had to talk through the hard times. And with us moving away from friends and family, it was just us. We had to rely on each other to make it. And I think that's really honestly what kept us together all those years. Thanks for listening to the Make Life Fun Show. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Leave us a review. We are also on YouTube as well. And wherever you like to listen to your podcast, let us know what you love about this show because the more you love it, the more other people can enjoy it too. And that ripple effect, right? So I am so glad you are here. Stay blessed by the best. Until next time, we will talk soon.